All right, Daniel chapter six. Uh, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, oh, King Darius, live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days, except you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group, and they found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or man except you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, king, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. <clears throat> When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to the king and said to him, Remember, O king, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. <clears throat> a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, O king. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language throughout the land, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of, of Darius, and the king 
of and the reign of of Cyrus the Persian. Uh, we're going to talk about um, this last verse. Um, so I'm going to read it as a, a one of the footnotes. Uh, also, um, also indicates as a possibility and the, the way it's written. Uh, so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius, that is the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, in just a in just a second. All right, so that's that's Daniel chapter six. Um, now, if we take take a look at the um, at the look section, um, and <clears throat> uh, Darius came to to power in 539 BC. So uh, we we saw that at the end of of um, the lesson last week, as uh, that the the rule of the Babylonians came to an end with King Belshazzar, and uh, he was he was assassinated, and uh, the the Medes and Persians took over. Uh, as they as they surrounded and, and captured the city of Babylon, uh, the kingdom of the Medes and Persians extended from present day Iran all the way over to Turkey. Um, and at this time, Daniel was probably he was he was in his eighties, possibly even around ninety years old. So um, so if you remember, he is he's taken as a teenager in um, six oh five B.C is when the first of the exiles, and Daniel was among in that group that was the first of the exiles to be taken. So, so he's, um, what, 60, 66 years already as, uh, as, as an exile, and is, is now, um, <clears throat> you know, and, and he was a teenager most likely. So if he's 15 to, to 20 years old, right? So he's, he's in his, mid to upper 80s, probably almost 90 years old at this, at this time. Um, so that, that helps us to maybe, uh, you know, get a, a little different, different picture. I think sometimes when we think of Daniel in the lion's den, I don't know that we always think of him as being that old. Uh, you know, uh, we, don't, we don't think of him as a, as a man like, you know, like uh, Tony, Tony Dilemma. We think of him more, more you know, somebody in, in their middle, middle ages. Uh, maybe maybe more like Stuart, uh, you know Stuart Wetzel rather than than uh, than Tony, uh, but uh, he's he's probably more you know along along the, that's that age. Hey, okay. um, he opened his his windows and that looked toward Jerusalem, and as he prayed, he prayed as he always did. So that facing facing toward Jerusalem, um, and. That actually is is referenced at the dedication to the temple uh, in First Kings chapter six, when Solomon has his prayer. Uh, he prays uh, concerning the temple, and he said, "When people uh, come toward this temple and pray toward this temple, uh, may you hear them." Um, and uh, uh, Franzman's Bible History Commentary has a good um, good description of that. Uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and and uh, and read that facing toward Jerusalem and and therefore toward the temple in prayer was a powerful reminder and reassurance that a person was praying to a reconciled father eager to forgive his penitent children and ready to hear all their other petitions as well. It has well been said that praying toward Jerusalem uh, was for Daniel um, similar to what what praying to be heard for the sake of Christ or when we ask in the name of Jesus uh, as, as we address our prayers uh, for New Testament believers. So, uh, it, and maybe that helps to understand a little bit, little bit better what, what he was doing. And remember, this was a regular occurrence. Um, and when we, when we see those verses uh, that, that Daniel uh, went up to his, to his upper room, uh, got down at his knees and three times a day uh, prayed, as he always did, right? This was his regular um, prayer and devotion and and worship time uh, on a daily basis. Uh, this is this is what he what he regularly did, uh, and I think it's important that that when that when the decree was made that put his life in jeopardy, if he if he did that, uh, Daniel didn't continue to do it, but do it in hiding. He continued to do it as he had before. Uh, he was making a testimony of of faith um, in in doing that. Okay, uh, and then that last verse uh, of the chapter, 
<coughs> that I reread. The NIV footnote uh, supports the uh, shows the translator's support of of the um, of the possibility that, that Darius was simply another name for Cyrus. Um, the the secular historians uh, show that Cyrus uh, and there's a lot of similarities there too. And if you if you uh, took took note of some of the things in the in the in the commentary in the People's Bible Commentary um, that uh, at the end of the chapter, uh, chapter five, we hear that, that when Darius took over ruling, he was 62 years old. The secular historians say that Cyrus was 62 years old when he took over as, as king. Um, so there's, there's a lot of similarities uh, that, are, that are there. And was, was Darius just another name for Cyrus? It, it seems as though that is the case. Uh, but again, there's a different name that's, that's used. And so we're not gonna dispute whether Darius was a real person or whether this actually happened. Um, but uh, those, those names, uh, it's also thought that, that Darius could possibly have been a title rather than, than uh, a personal name. <clears throat> uh, I believe it's um, the, the possible translation for Darius would be the one who holds the scepter, so another name for king. Um, and we, we see that in, in other places in the Old Testament as well. Uh, the... Um, when we see Abraham and later Isaac, uh, remember when he passes Sarah off as his, as his wife, he does that first of all down in, in, uh, in Egypt. And then he does it up in Canaan, right? With one of the Canaanite kings who's, who's called Abimelech. Um, and the name Abimelech means my father is king, okay? So was Abimelech his personal name? <clears throat> excuse me, was it his personal name or was it his title? Because we see other Abimelechs that are, are there in the scriptures as, as well. Is it, is it simply the dynasty of Abimelech or is it, is it more of a title? Uh, and I think, I think that possibility exists that, that Darius was more of a title than, than the, the personal, personal name. Uh, okay, um, questions on that because that, that's, that's one of the... Uh, from a, a human standpoint or from a secular standpoint, that's one of the, um, the, the critic, criticisms of the book of Daniel is that this, this Darius guy is, is not known to, to secular, secular history. Uh, and uh, as Christians, we do not have a problem with that uh, just because there's, there's no record of that. And, and these other explanations are, are quite, quite feasible and, and quite, uh, quite possible as, as well. So. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't dispute and say, well, um, not sure Darius was a real guy. Did Daniel in the lines then actually happen? Maybe this is just a story instead of a real event. No, everything that God, everything that God says uh, in this chapter indicates that it is a real event uh, that actually took place. Uh, and so that, um, and that last verse of the chapter, uh, I think helps also uh, is that, that uh, the, and the way the, 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 um, the connecting word "and" is used there. Uh, it's often it, it's often uh, translated uh, as a as a um, a parallel term rather than rather than a, a an additional term, right? And, um, and a positive that, that's the word I'm using. I was looking for. I was trying to figure trying to remember the actual uh, grammar grammar term. Uh, it's it's used uh, uh, the connecting connecting word is often used as an a positive in in a situation like that. So, all right, questions there. All right, well then let's take a look at the at the actual uh, text and the and the the questions along with that. Um, Why was it, in a, in a strange way, it's actually a compliment of sorts that the other, uh, other men were out to get Daniel? In what way is it, is it kind of a compliment that's, that they were out to get him? Uh, yeah, he was, he was accomplishing things, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and he was a good administrator yeah he's he's got this high standing right um the king loves him right and and the king has made every indication that he's going to 
uh, appoint Daniel as the the leader of the whole of the whole kingdom, right? That, that he's going to be he's going to be in charge of everybody, um, and uh, and so they're out to get him. They recognize the high standing that he has, uh, and then as they start to do their investigation, right? They they hire all these private investigators to try and try and dig up dirt on Daniel, and they're looking everywhere. They're they're not leaving a stone unturned. And they finally realize this guy is so squeaky clean that we can't find anything about him, uh, whether it's in the loyalty that he has to the, to the king or in his faithfulness of carrying out his duties, right? It's, it's not just he's really loyal to the king. He's doing everything he's supposed to. He's not leaving anything undone. He's completing every task, and he's doing every task well. Uh, you know, just all of these things is that. And finally, that, and and I think this is this is this is the highest compliment as well, even though it's it's not meant to be. Um, they finally realize, and they say, "We're never going to get anything against Daniel unless it has to do with compromising his faith." Right. So they even recognized that in Daniel, didn't they? They recognized, and that means that Daniel made his faith public. Right, he was he was he was exercising his faith in a public way, um, uh, and if you think back to the early early books of the Old Testament, uh, the, the the book of Genesis in particular, there's a term that's used um, in in the early chapters, and then is is used for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and it says they uh, that Abraham built an altar and he called on the name of the Lord. Uh, as he was living among the Canaanites, he called on the name of the Lord. Uh, in other words, Daniel didn't go into his tents and privately do these things. He was out in front of the in front of other people and, and making it very well known what God he worshipped. And that was plainly evident with Daniel also, right? And remember now, this guy's in his 80s. And and everybody in the in the in the uh, you know you know you get an almost a, a feeling that this is almost like a, a with the satraps and the and the the administrators and everything it's almost like a congress right it's and it's obvious it's obvious to everybody in congress that Daniel's faith is the most important thing to him his connection to his God and that he he only worships one God he doesn't worship all these gods. He only worships one God. He doesn't worship any of our gods. Everybody knew that. And not only did they know it, but they knew that he was so committed to that, but that that was the only way that they were ever going to get him in trouble is to have something that would interfere with what he was doing to worship his God. Uh, I, the, the more I study this account, the more that just jumps out at, at me as, as probably one of the key things. Daniel's, Daniel's witness to the world of who he was and what was the most important to him was obvious even to his most bitter enemies. Everybody knew that, um, including Darius, right? Including Darius. Because when, when Darius can't do anything to save Daniel, he says, may the God whom you serve rescue you. Uh, and, and again, <clears throat> the most high God, um, I don't know that he's acknowledging that, that, that the Lord is the most high God. I think he's probably using a term that he, that he had heard Daniel use. Um, and we, we've seen that term in the earlier chapters, had he read through the, the history of, of the Babylonians and had seen, seen this. And, you know, um, so he's using, he's using a term that I'm sure he heard, heard Daniel use. Uh, but, but he also knew, right? And, and the fact that, that Daniel was, was so committed to his one God did not interfere with the king's desire to raise him up to such a high high position in the government, um, just some some tremendous compliments for Daniel. And I I guess that you know in applying that to us, um, you know just you know what a uh, oh that that could be said about each of us, right? That that 
uh, we're never going to, if, if somebody's out to get you, that they can never get you unless they, they figure out a way that's going to make you compromise your faith. Uh, you know, I don't know that any, the people could say that they, they, they could dig up enough dirt about me to, 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 you know, to make me, make me embarrassed. Right. Uh, and, and I think the same is true for all of us, right? We've done enough things in our lives and, 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 uh, you know, it's like, okay. Um, yeah, if people really wanted to go after me. They could probably dig up some stuff on me, uh, <clears throat> but they couldn't with Daniel. Right? And that's the, that's the highest compliment for, for a, a believer in Jesus, uh, for, for people to say this, this person is, is so faithful in what they're doing that the only way we could ever discredit them is by, by having something that's going to, going to make them compromise their faith. Um, I think if we get nothing else out of this lesson, um, to take that home with us and to, to, to make that our goal in life, that, that people, uh, people who, who, who like us are going are gonna to know that about us, but people who don't like us are also going to know that about us. And, and to recognize that this is the most important thing in, in my life. Uh, we can talk about a lot of different things, um, but uh, the highest compliment is for somebody to come and come to you and say, I know how much your God means to you. Um, I'm going through some stuff right now. Could uh, you, you, seem to, you seem to have a good handle on your faith. Could, could you help me through, through this? Uh, what a blessing, right? To, that, that, that somebody outside of, of the bonds of, of the Christian faith would actually come to you because they recognize that there's something in you that, that you might have the, the answer to, to something that they're going through. Um, what a blessing. Um, I, I actually had that privilege here. To, in fact, I've got to, got to follow up with that this, this evening yet. Um, one of our neighbors, uh, they've got three, three young boys, and uh, she just messaged me and said, I know you're a pastor, um, and I, I, I grew up Catholic, but my, my husband grew up Lutheran. Um, could you baptize our three boys? Uh, you know, and, and just this, this, this aspect of, you know, uh, recognizing, recognizing that, um, now, okay, they know I'm a, they know I'm a pastor. So, you know, that's, that's great. But, but hopefully, you know, after these three years of being neighbors, uh, we've developed enough relationship that she actually feels comfortable to come to me and ask, ask me to actually, actually do that. Um, have I ever sat down and given her a law gospel presentation? No, I haven't. Uh, but I've had lots of conversations with her and her husband and her family and stuff. And, and so there's, there's an opportunity that God gives to us in, in that. Um, and, you know, what, a, what an awesome thing when, when, things, like that, when that, things like that take place. Um, so, yeah, uh, they were jealous of Daniel's high standing and the king's favor. Um, and the, the only way they realized they were going to get Daniel is, is by, uh, you know, doing making up something that was going to make, force him to, to compromise on, on his faith. Because uh, they knew, right? They, they, they put that, e they, they tricked the king into making that edict because they knew that Daniel wouldn't do that. That was the one thing they knew they could get Daniel on because they knew he was not going to pray to the king. They knew that he was going to continue doing exactly what he did. Daniel had made that very clear throughout his life, and everybody knew it. Uh, what a blessing, uh, and what a, what a, uh, what a compliment to, to God's people. All right, so when the decree goes into effect, what choices did Daniel have to make? And this is kind of a re repeat of, of what happened to him right away when he got, got, uh, when, when he got taken into exile, right? If you think back to chapter one uh, with, the, with uh, the training and the food incident, right? This, this was the, again, Daniel's got a choice to make here. Okay. Uh, go ahead, uh, Larry and Sue. Um, he chose to follow God. The other choice was to give up God and follow whatever rules and regulations. Yeah. Do I, do I save my neck or do I save my faith? <laughs> is really what it, what it boiled down to, right? 
Um, I have I have the choice to uh, or you know there's a third choice right I want to continue to to worship God but um, I'm going to do it downstairs in a closet now instead of up on the roof like I normally do. Uh, which would be tantamount to denying the Lord as well because now you know what is what does God say He says do not do not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot harm the soul. Uh, and and to change his course of action at that point and take it into into hiding uh, would have would have made it the you know he would have been more afraid of people than he was of 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 God. Uh, so he could either worship the king, which meant a high position, right, the greatest kingdom of the world, right, because the king had already determined he was going to put him uh, put him into into this high position and it would save his life. Or he could continue to worship the Lord as he was doing and face a horrible death by, you know, being eaten by lions and crushed, crushed to death. Um, so, you know, that's, um, uh, you know, as I said in the opening opening prayer tonight, um, you know, we have we have um, some challenges to our faith, but uh, I don't know that any of us have had this kind of a challenge where uh, I either do this or I or I die. Um, but but there are Christians living in the world right now today uh, that 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 are facing are facing that very thing. Uh, I just read something here the other the the other day that's um, I think in both China and India right now there's a there's a, a pretty pretty severe persecution that is that is uh, coming. They're they're coming into the house churches now and and uh, arresting and and you know people are. Are, are facing the possibility of, of losing, losing their homes, losing their jobs, and possibly even losing their, their lives. Uh, and that's exactly what was happening in, in the first century. Um, right, uh, when, uh, if, you look, if you look at the New Testament letter to the Ephesians, when it's one of the, uh, the prison letters, it's one of the, the letters that, that the Holy Spirit gave to the Apostle Paul while, while he was in his first imprisonment in Rome. Uh, but he's writing to uh, Christians in Ephesus who are who are facing that very same thing, um, and that's why the, his opening words he reminds them of how much God loves them and that that God has His arms wrapped around them and always has and always will. Uh, that's one of those beautiful sections where God says, "Before from eternity, God God had you picked out, uh, and He's always loved you, and He always will." Uh, because when those when those things start happening uh, on a day to day basis, you can begin to question whether it's really worth it. Uh, question whether God loves you. Um, is it is it worth it to lose my family? Is it worth it to lose my 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 job? Now I don't have an income. I'm going to lose my home. Uh, you know, this, all these things that I've that I've had and worked so hard for, try and provide for my family, and I thank God for them. Uh, but I'm going to lose it all if I continue to continue my 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 present uh, present course of action of 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 worshiping the Savior. Um, so you know you have you have those those things, um, and uh, they are they are challenges for for people. Um, and we face we face it to a much less less uh, you know less serious consequences. Uh, but we have those those same things. We'll talk about that more at the, at the last the last question tonight. All right, let's go on to number three. For a change, a king was truly humble and honored, honored the true God. Um, how did the king express, and I, I wouldn't necessarily say his faith in the Lord, but he acknowledged the reality of, of Daniel's God. How does he acknowledge the reality of, of Daniel's God? He made a decree. Yes. Yeah. He makes a decree, right? Uh, well, and um, this is at that's at the end. But what happens? It you know you you might think that when the king issues a decree and the 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 noblemen come and say Daniel, and notice they don't say Daniel, your high official. They say Daniel, the exile from Judah. Right, this foreigner, right? You've you've raised him up to a, this high position, but 
he's a foreigner. He's not one of us. He's not listening to you. He's not honoring you. And you might think that the king would respond with anger. Right? He's angry that somebody didn't follow the law. Uh, but the king is distressed by that. Um, he actually goes to all of his, his lawyers and, uh, you know, digging up in the laws and, and doing everything he can to try and, and get Daniel out of this. And then as Daniel is being thrown into the lion's den, uh, right, if we, if we go back to, to those, uh, those words again, uh, let's see, let me just find them real quick here. Uh, all right, so he says, uh, so the king gives the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. Okay, um, he's acknowledging the, the power of, of Daniel's God. And we don't know that he had the opportunity to see that personally, but uh, no doubt the Babylonians left behind some records, and no doubt Darius has read through some of those records. He's had enough conversations with Daniel, um, and maybe Daniel's already told him a little bit about some of the history. Uh, maybe he's already read about the, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had with the statue with all the different different things, right? And and you know, after after the head after the head crumbles, right, you've got the uh, you've got the the shoulders and the and the torso, right? That's the the, the Medes and the Persians. Um, so you know he knows that 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 Daniel has already done this. He knows that, that Daniel's Daniel's given all the credit to the God that he serves. Uh, did he also know? Did he also have have record and, and learn about uh, Daniel's friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and and how how they were spared from the from the furnace. Um, you know, I don't know, but he knows enough about Daniel, and he knows enough about Daniel's God to express that that wish to Daniel. Uh, I wouldn't call it a prayer, but uh, he does express. Uh, Daniel, I, I sure hope your your God, whom you serve, can can rescue you from 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 this from this predicament. Um, and it's a uh, we don't see we don't see Darius being being the arrogant one here. Uh, we see the nobles, right, and the satraps, and all these people who are plotting against them. They're the they're the arrogant ones, right? They're the prideful ones. Uh, but but Darius, um, and and I don't know did. Did uh, Daniel also maybe share a little bit if, if Darius is indeed Cyrus? Um, did he uh, also share with him uh, the words of, of the Lord through Isaiah, where Cyrus is mentioned by name as the one who is going to deliver, the, deliver God's people and bring them back from exile? Um, you know, uh, the, the name of Cyrus is mentioned in in the, the 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 Old Testament prophet Isaiah, and Isaiah is written in the around 700, right? So this is right almost 200 years, 150, 200 years before Cyrus is 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 in command. So this is before Cyrus is even born. The Lord mentions Cyrus by name as the king who is going to return the exiles. Um, did Daniel share that with him? Uh, I don't know, but you know, to to have to have that kind of uh, that that kind of experience, right? And uh, King Darius, uh, did he have faith in the true God? I'm not going to say he did. Uh, I don't know that we that that we can say that from from this because he he seems to be expressing the same kinds of of uh, honor to to the Lord that uh, Nebuchadnezzar did. Uh, he is the greatest of the gods. Uh, listen to listen to the God of Daniel. Uh, honor the God of Daniel, uh, because he is he is the greatest of the gods. Uh, that's not an expression of faith. Uh, that's acknowledging that 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 God is 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 really powerful. Um, but I wouldn't call that an expression uh, a confession of 
of faith as, as the, the only God who saves. Uh, okay? um, so he humbly expressed the fact and, and the wish that, that, da that Daniel's God would protect him. Um, again, uh, he knew about Daniel's life of prayer. Uh, and right, Daniel made it very evident. Right? All of the noblemen knew it, knew it as well. But I think the, the really interesting thing here is that, that, that Darius did not consider Daniel's faith to be an, a hindrance to serving well as a world, ru ru world ruler. Uh, and again, as, as many would have, and as, as the other uh, you know, leaders, they were, they were looking at, and, and I'm not sure that, that, they, that they saw Daniel Daniel's faith as being a hindrance to serving well, right? They just they just don't like him because he's he's such he's such a good faithful ruler that he's making them look bad, right? And and uh, right, it's 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 that it's that age old thing, right? If if you're working really hard at your job and everybody else isn't. Right, you're going to start to get pressure. Right, don't finish that so fast. You finish yours so fast, you get too many done. That makes us look bad. Uh, and that's kind of the scenario that we have. Daniel is doing such an exceptional job, doing what what God has called him to do, that these other guys are are looking bad, uh, and Daniel is rising, rising. Uh, you know going leaps and bounds uh, above them and, and over them to the point where he's going to get a higher position than they, than they are. Uh, and they just don't like that. Uh, but the king, the king certainly did not see that as, as being a deterrent. Oh, Daniel worships a different God than, than we do. He only worships one God instead of a whole bunch of gods. Uh, I'm not sure I want to put him in this position. No, he, he, he was looking at, at that as actually being, a, you know, this, this must be part of what makes Daniel tick because he is such a faithful servant. Uh, and even though he's not one of us, right, uh, Daniel really took the words of, of um, Jeremiah chapter 29 to heart. Uh, and and uh, we've, we've talked about those several times already uh, with the exiles. And um, you know the the we're we're mostly familiar with that uh, with verse ten, right? The Lord says, "I I know the plans I have for you," says the Lord. Uh, plans to to make you prosper and do well. Plans to have you succeed, right? Uh, and give you a hope and a future. Uh, but before that, He's telling them, "When you get there, do your best at what you do. Uh, you know, build your homes, plant your plant your fields and and gardens." Uh, you know, use your gifts, uh, serve the king, because if, if that nation prospers under, under your, uh, the things that you're doing, you're going to prosper too. Uh, and, 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 and what happens, right? God is going to be glorified. And think of how many times already, just in, in these first six chapters, that, that the God of, of Israel is being honored by a heathen nation. Just because of God's faithful servants that are that are are serving in the in the kingdom. Uh, the, the God of Daniel and the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego has been honored, and decrees have been written and proclaimed throughout the whole kingdom, acknowledging that the God of Daniel is the most powerful among the gods. Now, again, like I said, that's not a confession of faith, but it is a, a, a fulfillment of what Jesus says when in the Sermon on the Mount, when he says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Uh, what, a, what an awesome thing. And, and, uh, and we know, right, from... 500 years after this, when Jesus is born in Bethlehem in Judea, the Magi from the east saw his star and came to worship him. These are, those Magi are people who are living in this area of, of the world. 
Um, so whatever witness that Daniel and the rest of the exiles are giving had an impact on the people who were living there. Uh, it, and I think that really ties in also uh, to the sermon from Sunday when we were looking at the parable of the weeds among the wheat. Right? When I continue to live as wheat and, not, and, and, and give honor and praise to God and, and uh, you know, have as, as many opportunities as possible to let this the, to, to shine like stars in the kingdom, uh, as Jesus says at the end of that parable, which he says ultimately is fulfilled when we get to heaven. But it happens right now, as Jesus says, let your light shine, uh, that, that the, God is going to be honored and, and praised uh, in, in that. Um, so if we spend our time living as wheat and not spend all of our time trying to weed out all the weeds, uh, God is going to be praised in that. And uh, it's just a, a wonderful witness and a wonderful testimony to who, whom God has, has made us. Because notice what Daniel's doing all, all the time, right? And he's going to do it here again tonight. Um, God, it, Daniel's giving all credit to God in everything, whether he's, whether he's being saved from the lion's mouth, uh, whether he is interpreting a dream or a vision of Belshazzar, whether he's interpreting writing on the wall, uh, you know, uh, whether he's interpreting another dream, whatever, whatever it is, Daniel's always giving the honor and credit to the God he serves, uh, which again indicates uh, a humble use of the multitude of gifts that, that God had given to Daniel. Uh, and notice what that humility does. And notice what the humility doesn't do. The humility that Daniel had didn't have him hiding in a corner. Saying, God gets all the credit, so I'm not, I'm not going to do anything. No, he, he boldly and confidently used the gifts that God had given to him, but then was very quick to acknowledge and, and give all glory and credit to the, to the Lord for the ability to uh, interpret the writing on the wall, to uh, the ability to interpret the dreams and tell what they, what they meant, the, the ability to even... Uh, admonish King Nebuchadnezzar and say, you know, repent uh, what you're, of all these things that you're doing. Uh, perhaps the Lord will spare you. Uh, you know, but the, that boldness, um, the, Daniel's boldness was, was uh, uh, in harmony with the humility that he had. Right? So I can be, I can be humble and bold at the same time. And then I think sometimes we think, well, I can't, I, I can't do both, right? I'm either humble or I'm bold, because we think of boldness as being, as being arrogant. And boldness is not arrogant. Uh, it can be, right? But I can, I can be bold in what I, what I know and believe and confess and still be humble. Uh, and that's really the key uh, in our lives as, as uh, uh, as as the as the Lord's Lord's uh, servants in our in our lives. Okay. Number four. How complete was God's deliverance? Yep. Very complete. Okay. <laughs> Not a scratch on Daniel. Right. They didn't. Even, they did. The lions didn't even paw at him. Right? He had no teeth marks on him. Uh, he didn't come, come up there with only one arm instead of two arms. Uh, you know, he, he said, well, I, I got out of there, but wow, it was rough. Nope. Uh, not a scratch on him. Uh, and we know, right, he says, the Lord sent his angel and he shut the lion's mouths. Um, we know it wasn't because, uh, you know, uh, Darius slipped him some some drugs to give to the the lions and knocked him out for the for the night, right? So that that the, the lions slept through the night and and uh, so Daniel was was spared. Um, there wasn't a, a a high high rock that he could jump up on that the lions couldn't get to him. No, the the, the, the angels shut the, the mouths of the lions, and we know it wasn't because they had a really good full meal the day before and they weren't hungry enough to eat him. How do we know that? Uh, 
Well, we know that afterwards because uh, the people who accused him and their wives and children were thrown into the lions and they they destroyed them all. Right, they didn't even hit the ground right before they were they before they were torn apart. Um, and so we know that those lions were hungry. Uh, we know that they were vicious. Uh, they just weren't hungry. Uh, they just weren't vicious uh, to Daniel. Uh, and that was solely due to the angel uh, watching watching over, right? So uh, Daniel was not harmed in any way, shape, or form. His enemies, however, right, killed before they hit the ground in the lion's den. Um, so Daniel's deliverance was not due to, he was just a really good lion tamer. Uh, you know, he had worked in the circus at one time and, and was able to, you know, keep him back. Uh, you know, just, it wasn't any of those things. Um, it was it was all due to, to the Lord sending His angel to to watch watch over Daniel and to to keep him keep him safe and in His tender care. All right, number five. Uh, once again, the Lord and the idols of the nations uh, were uh, were paired off, and in this case, Darius himself was duped into being the idol. Uh, but once again, what happens? Uh, and this is that recurring theme, remember, throughout, throughout the book of Daniel. Um, the, 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 the challenge uh, among, the, among the idols and, and those who worship idols and the Lord always showing himself to be the one and only God, right? So, excuse me. So uh, Darius praised the Lord, confessing God's power and, and, uh, and love. Um, he even, again, writes a decree, writes a letter, um, and, and decrees uh, an, another decree that, that supersedes his previous one, right? Uh, that, that now he commands all people to, to, uh, to give honor and praise to, to Daniel's God because of what he did. Uh, that that, that we, have, we have a guy here, we have, we have proof uh, that, that Daniel's God is powerful because Daniel got thrown into the pit with the lions and he came out without a scratch. Uh, and in this way, then, uh, the Lord is glorified far beyond the, the borders of, of Babylon, and, and uh, it goes out to, to, uh, to, the, to all the peoples of the, of the kingdom. And remember, uh, the kingdom extends from, uh, from uh, what would be present-day Iran all the way over to, to Turkey, uh, so pretty much all the way over to the border of, border of Greece. Uh, so it's a vast, vast nation. That also helps us to understand the 120 uh, satraps that are, are spread throughout the kingdom, right? So uh, think of the satraps maybe as, as governors, and, and then the, the administrators are the, you know, uh, the, the uh, board of advisors, and then, then, you, have the, then you have the king. Uh, but uh, that, that final decree that he, that he makes, um, he, he again, gives honor and praise to, to God's power uh, and his ability to save, right? To, to spare, spare Daniel from the, from the lion's den. Um, notice what it doesn't have, right? It has nothing about forgiveness. Uh, it has nothing about eternal life. It has nothing, right? So this, this decree is not, a, again, it's not a confession of faith. He's missing, he's missing the key elements of a confession of faith. Um, but to, for, for even even the, this ungodly, ungodly heathen king to acknowledge uh, the, the power of, of uh, the God of, of Daniel uh, is, is an amazing thing. And, and again, God gets the glory, uh, even, even from the pen of, of, a, of an unbelieving king. Okay? Um, and then as we, as we uh, apply it to our own lives, right, you think of, of times when you've had to to make a choice uh, similar to, to, you know, that Daniel was forced to make. There's, there's times in our lives where we have to decide, am I going to, am I going to go along with the world or am I going to honor God? And what happens if I honor God? Uh, how are the people around me uh, going, to, going to respond? Um, and it may be something, you know, going all the way back, you think about when uh, you were kids or when you were teenagers and, and now, uh, you know, your friends want to want to do something that you know uh, that as a Christian, I don't want to be doing that. Whether it's an underage drinking party, whether it's, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it might be, 
right? And, <clears throat> and now I've got to make a choice. Do I honor God and face the, the ridicule or the wrath of, of the people around me? Or do I go along with the, with the crowd? Um, you know, and that's, that's, that's kind of what's, what Daniel was, was faced. Um, I don't know if, if anybody has any, any specifics that, that they would be, be wanting to share, but uh, I'll give you a moment and, and think about that. And if anybody wants to share anything, uh, we're all ears. We've got a few minutes left. Hey, Pastor, this is Gwen. Yes, Gwen. Um, my cousin, um, he became a Christian about the same time I did, so later in life. And um, he uh, um, started dating a, a woman, and uh, he was, they decided to move in together. And it was really hard for me, <laughs> but I, uh, I talked to him. Um, he lives in Tallahassee, so I, I couldn't talk to him face to face, but I, right. <laughs> I messaged him on Facebook after he had posted about them moving in together. And I just, I kind of shared some scripture with him where I told him I, I felt like that was wrong. Um, that they, they were actually both Christians. And I uh -huh. said, I don't really, I don't really understand what you're doing. Um, bragging, not bragging, but you know, like you seem to think that's, this as a yeah, celebratory yeah, thing. Yes. exactly, exactly. And, uh, and I was mortified because I just thought for sure that <laughs> he would just blast me, you know. And, yeah. But to my surprise, he acknowledged that I was right and, um, and, and thanked me for pointing that out. And I, I couldn't, you know, he's kind of a joker, so I couldn't tell if he was being facetious or not. But, but it wasn't long after that that he announced they were engaged and were going to get married. So, mm -hmm. um I did something similar like that with my brother too. <laughs> yeah, where I kind of called him and out. It's hard because when it's it the is. people that are the, the closest yes. to you, right? And, yes. and that really hits home then when when Jesus when Jesus says, you know, uh, father father against against uh, or mother against daughter and daughter in law yeah. against mother in law and and yeah. his enemies will be the member of his, of his own family and say, okay, yep. when I've got to stand up for Jesus. Uh, yeah. I'm risking, I'm risking yeah. uh, losing these relationships. Yep, yep. And I was just, especially with my brother, I was terrified that he mm -hmm. would never speak to me again. And he kind of intimated that kind of thing right. when I told him. Um, and, uh, oh, I mean, it was just so hard. But uh, in the end, he, again, in that, that case, it was a happy ending, too, because he proposed to um, have his current wife. So they, okay. they did marry. But... <laughs> Yeah, it's a, just, it's a hard thing. I know they think I'm nosy and meddling and, you know, but I just felt like, you know, so, someone has to say something. Right. And, yeah. and I feel like if you're sharing scripture, you can't go wrong there because it's not exactly. you. It's, it's the Lord that says this. And right. so those are two times that I can think of yeah. where it was really hard to yeah. say something where I felt, you know, am I doing the right thing? But in both cases, I'm so glad I did because yeah. it, it really made a, I feel like it made a difference. Yes, it does. It sure does. And, you know, and, um, you know, that there's, and it's a, it's a hard thing, right? To say, okay, now how do I choose, how do I choose these words? Uh, how do I, how do I say this in a way? Uh, Cause I need to speak the truth to them. Right. And then you think of Ephesians four and God says, instead of speaking the truth in love, right? We, we, we want to speak the truth in love and we want to, um, say say it in a way that's going to build them up rather than tear them down but we still have to we still have to speak the truth to them uh of of what god says yeah and that's a that's a really hard thing excellent hey okay. uh right uh, so our choices may not be life and death as they were with with uh daniel um but they are are uh nonetheless right real uh and things that, that we do face on a regular regular basis all right. So God once again shows that He is the Lord over uh, peoples and and nation. Uh, he he uh, is the one who continues to to be glorified in all things. And uh, you know, we even see uh, again uh, another heathen king and another uh, successive uh, kingdom, right, going from the Babylonians now to the Medes and Persians. Uh, but that that uh, He is He is honored. Uh, and and even a decree written um, to give him give him honor and praise for what what he has has done. Okay, questions, comments.
All right, as we wrap up tonight, um, <clears throat> uh, realize a couple of things. So we are through the first six chapters. So we're halfway through the book of Daniel now. And uh, we, beginning with chapter seven now, uh, this, this chapter six ends the first half of, of Daniel, which is often described as a historical section of Daniel. Uh, now we're going to get to the prophetical uh, section of Daniel, the last, last six chapters. Uh, and there's going to be four different, different visions uh, and dreams that Daniel is going to have. And they're going to sound very similar, right? They're, they're going to be uh, some of the same, same things that we've heard uh, Daniel interpreting early, early on, but now Daniel himself is having, having some of these. All right. Uh, so we'll take Daniel chapter seven uh, next time and uh, the first of the visions that, that Daniel receives. Okay. Let's close in tonight with prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for showing us once again uh, what, it, what it means to, uh, to keep you number one in our lives. We know, Lord, that that's not always an easy thing, but that you will always bless us as we do it. Uh, and you don't promise to rescue us uh, in the way that you rescued da Daniel. Uh, we, we know that from other, other parts of Scripture. You, you didn't do that uh, for, for Stephen. You, you allowed him to, to be delivered by, by going to heaven. Uh, but uh, you, Lord, you do promise to be with us and you promise to deliver us in the way that's going to be eternally best for us. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word tonight and we ask that you would continue to guide us as we seek to place you number one in our lives each and every day. Guide us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you.